Now, um, the optimum matched filter is going to have a sine x over x form with 13 dB side lobes. And with those high side lobes, they can be mistaken for weak nearby targets. Uh, one potential solution is to amplitude taper on transmit, uh, but clusterons, TWTs, and cross-field amplifiers, they're different types of power amplifiers, uh, don't operate in saturation, and transmit uh, solid-state transmitters can, but most often don't have this capability, the high efficiency, and it's seldom done. Time side lobes of linear FM waveforms are usually reduced by applying the amplitude weighting on the received pulse. And typical re results are you'll have a mismatch loss of about 1 dB, but you'll get the peak side lobes reduced down 30 dB, which is good for resolving the, the targets. So you lose a dB in power on the whole game, but you gain 30 dB in rejecting the, the side lobes you have with a typical sine x over x waveform. And this is how uh, you'd implement in boxes narrowband pulse compression. Uh, receive linear FM wide pulse, and the wide pulse will, will give you good detection in this scenario. And we process uh, this signal to narrowband pulse range resolution. And what we do is we have a couple of targets coming in. And then we have the reference local oscillator. And we re re and for the whole length of the pulse width, we subtract off the local oscillator frequency so that we're down to baseband where we subtract it off here. Then we come in and we A to D it, down convert, put it through an FFT, match filter it, inverse FFT. This is just the convolution. And here we see are three pulses. And notice we're talking about range separations in the order of kilometers between the different pulses. Okay. Now stretch processing operates quite differently. In many cases the high bandwidth radar system has instantaneous bandwidth that's far greater than the sampling rates as I said in an A to D converter. A good example would be uh, a gigahertz of bandwidth in an, at X band. And it's, it's more than you can do with off the shelf, it will certainly A to D converters, where you want to get a lot of bits in your A to D converter. In these cases, uh, stretch processing is used. It's interesting to note that uh, Dr. Caputi of AIL was awarded the IEEE Dennis Picard Medal in 2005 for his development of this technique and other significant achievements. Uh, I was on that committee of the Dennis Picard uh, Award Committee, the, the medal, and, uh, and it's given yearly to a really truly great um, innovation in radar systems and technology. And I think it was a year or two before that it was started and uh, so that shows you the significance of Dr. Caputi's um, invention. And this can be employed, this stretch processing can be employed to yield high range resolution commensurate with very high bandwidth. But, but the but is he sacrifices limited range window by processing the data in a manner that makes use of the unique range Doppler coupling in linear FM waveforms. And this technique is going to be described in detail. And I'll be quite frank with you. Ten years ago, and I'm 70, I had never built a system that had stretch processing in it. I had always worked with air defense systems. I hadn't worked in um, with systems that operated with gigahertz bandwidths. And I, I heard of stretch processing, I knew about it. But I didn't, I didn't understand it. And it wasn't, it wasn't explained well in a book, any book that I saw. And so I finally figured it out one time. And, uh, it's described reasonably well, uh, in a book, um, whose author escapes me that was published by Hughes and now published by SciTech in an introductory book. But it, but it wasn't in a manner which 
I could convince myself, yeah, I understand what this means. <laughs> so I'm, I had to put together, uh, I was at a radar conference and it was a very, very boring session downstairs. So I was up in my room at my computer and over the course of an hour, hour and a half, I put together a half a dozen view graphs, which I have, you know, tuned and tuned, which they explained to me how stretch processing works. And uh, interesting, I haven't given this lecture in five years. So let's see how I remember, four years probably. So let's see how I remember uh, explaining it in detail. Okay, this is the stretch processing example. We're going to transmit a 1 gigahertz bandwidth wideband linear FM pulse at X band that's a millisecond long a thousand microseconds of pulse length. And here we see that in the frequency domain. And it goes from nine and a half gigahertz up to ten and a half gigahertz. And it does that in a thousand microseconds. And then microseconds go way out. And that corresponds to a range window of 150 kilometers. Well, out to this break, it'd be, you know, like go oh, 300, 350 kilometers. But it could be, the pulse could go out 1,000 kilometers. Okay? Now, we've got a return from a stationary target at 600 kilometers. And I put this break in here because I can't make the, you know, we've just got a, a reasonably rectangular view graph. So this is a lot of kilometers in this break and a lot of microseconds. So here out at four to 5,000 microseconds is the return from a stationary target at 600 kilometers. Moving up just like that. And it's out here at 600 to 750 kilometers. That slope moves out. But the beginning to here is 600 kilometers. And over here we say it in a box, a gigahertz uh, in a, um, a millisecond it corresponds to 150 kilometers in range, delta R. And one microsecond is 150 meters. And we want to see some targets that are real close to each other. Right here we've got a stationary target. Call it a sphere if you want. So this, this should be readily understandable to everyone who's seen things so far. Now let's say we've got this in the same general area two stationary targets at 600 kilometers and 600 plus 600.006 kilometers. It looks like the same thing completely overlaps. Now, we haven't got the bandwidth in an ADD converter to digitize that whole gigahertz of bandwidth. What do we do? Okay, first let's just expand that graph and take that graph we had before with the two targets, one literally on top of the other on this top scale and we're going to expand a little bit the scale and frequency, but it's the same, you know, amount. But we're going to ex expand enormously this section of range and time. The, the section from 4,000 to 4,000.04 microseconds. So if we could expand that scale enough, we'd see that actually there were two targets here. Now how do we resolve this so that an operator can actually see the targets? Okay, what we do is we use a narrowband waveform to say, hey, there's a target out there. So we know that there's something out there of interest, and then we hit away with it with a wideband waveform, which gives us a general idea where we know where the target is. So say what we do is we generate 
within our computer system, the receiver, the pulse compression system, a ramp which uh, goes from, which doesn't start at, at, at way back when in kilometers, but starts at 3,999.96, you know, a ways back. We generate a reference ramp. We mix the radar echo signal with a linear FM reference ramp having the same slope as the transmitted pulse. And you see that from this reference ramp, the relative range is 0, 6, and 12 from the 0 reference here. Okay? And we've still got, we haven't done anything hokey. Now, that what we do then is we apply to this signal, we, we, after we, we do the referencing and we, uh, we mix them, what we're left with is the difference in frequency. And, and what we're left with is these two differences in frequency between the target and the reference. So this would be the reference frequency, this would be the first, and then the second. And this gives you the relative range from the reference range, 6 and 12. Now, the separation and distance of the two targets corresponding to a time delay of delta R, C, uh, delta, T, delta T over 2. The relative time delay is, is related to the above target frequencies through the slope of the FM waveform. So we can easily tell the differences. And all, and since this, these are frequencies, you, you just do an FFT on this and you'll get two spikes at the relative range of the targets. Okay? So this, this frequency is the frequency of the target return after deramping. And this range is the range of the target from beginning of the range window, which the deramping started at. And that's the slope of the transmitted pulse. So we win. The round trip time from the target to the beginning of the zero is T, capital R, and bingo. Over a limited range window, we can separate these. Okay. Now this is how you'd implement it. Say we have two targets and their relative range difference is very small. And this is the range chirp, the range linear FM. What we do is subtract them, and the reference would be not just the beginning slope, but the it, it wouldn't, wouldn't just be the beginning frequency of the ramp, but also the, um, the, the reference that you'd add, which would be the start of your um, wideband window in frequency space. And you get a wideband input, signal amplitude, send that through an A to D converter after the reference chirp is in, and digitally down convert, and then do a process which I won't get into, which is transverse equalization. That's to, to take into account the fact that the pulse, transmitted pulse width isn't perfectly a square wave and, and the weighting on receive and then run it through a complex FFT and here we can see uh, with handing weighting on the uh, on the receive side uh, we can see a delta range of one meter easily between the two targets so that's how uh, stretch processing really works now, in summary, for linear FM uh, systems,
These waveforms are most often the way we implement pulse compression. They're less complex, complex than other methods, especially if stretch processing is not appropriate. We wait on receive, we, and we get the side lows from 13.2 down to 30 dB with that 1 dB loss. And range coupling is sometimes of little consequences in most cases where it's used. Okay, now let's go to the last, well, not the last, the next of the last section, face-coded um, waveforms. Now here's a blow-up of what I showed you before and I'm going to go over it again once more. Uh, the chain, I'll just, just by reading to you this over, because I've said basically all of this to you. A change in phase can be used to increase the signal pulse bandwidth. Um, the pulses of duration, capital T, the whole pulse width, we divide up into N subpulses of duration tau. Okay, and the phase of each pulse is changed or not changed according to binary phase and that's the phase changes would be zero or pi and with a, that's a plus or a minus and you can visually see this goes up this goes down that didn't go up so that had a phase change and then it goes down up didn't go down so you can you can see how the pluses and minuses you've got different phase codes and uh, pulse compression filter output will be a compressed pulse of width tau, small, and a peak n times that of the uncompressed pulse. So we get a gain in resolution, we get better resolution by that ratio of that pulse compression ratio of uh, capital T to tau.